Hello, welcome to the Nathan Hale Homestead. My name is Bev and I am the site administrator here. This is where Nathan Hale was born and raised and he lived in a very small house that was on the property from the 1750s. The house behind me was where his family lived. His mother, Elizabeth Hale, had uh, 12 children um, with her husband, Deacon Hale. Um, in 1775, Nathan Hale actually became captain of an army for the Revolutionary War. And in 1776, uh, Nathan Hale was hanged by the British as a spy. Nathan Hale is uh, most known for his famous last words right before he was hung, and those words were... I only regret that I have but one life to lose for this country. Elizabeth, the mother, died after her 12th child in the house. Which left Deacon Richard Hale um, able to remarry a widow by the name of Abigail Adams. She had seven children of her own. The family combined made up of 19 children. They needed a larger farmhouse, so back in 1776, they wound up building this house here, so this way it can encompass their larger family. Of the eight sons, six of them fought in the American Revolution. Nathan is killed as a spy. Um, and then the, there are three more that their lives were greatly affected by the war. The oldest son came back, and he's described as infirm. But he wasn't able to run the farm, he wasn't able to do much work, never married, had a family. So we wonder if perhaps he was affected as, today we would have stress disorder or shell shock. Um, but for whatever reason, the oldest son, he lived a long time, but he didn't really um, contribute much to the farm. Two other of the sons came back and they had evidently been on British prison ships. And when they returned to Coventry, they died of disease, leaving their young families. So um, the Hales, Richard and Abigail, actually raised a number of their grandchildren because the sons had died um, due to the American Revolution. Deacon Hale lived here at the house until about 1802 when he died. After he died for a few decades, uh, generations of the Hale family lived and occupied the house after that. In 1914, the house and property was acquired by George Dudley Seymour, who uh, restored the house because the house was left in ruins uh, before he bought it. Um, I'd like to introduce you to George Dudley Seymour. This was an eccentric and very wealthy uh, attorney from New Haven. And in 1913, he came to Coventry to find Nathan Hale's house. He loved the story of Nathan Hale. He was very patriotic. And so he wanted to own the house and furnish it and restore it. So he fixed up the house and he was really interested in the history of the house. And he actually went about buying uh, different artifacts that were sold off after Deacon died. And uh, I believe he bought Nathan Hale's trunk from when he was in the army. Uh, and he bought various other um, artifacts and they're actually in the house now. Uh, when he came here, he had read a letter in his collection of many things that was written by one of Nathan Hale's nieces, Rebecca. And it said that in the North Chamber where she grew up as a girl, there was actually a profile done in pencil, a shadow portrait, if you will, of Nathan Hale. And um, so George W. Seymour came here. He evidently came to the chamber. He took this door off and had the door, take, took the door, had this stripped, and there is indeed a, a pencil mark of, a, of a, the profile of a young man. Now it's slightly larger than life because it would have been done to a candle, the shadow on a candle perhaps. Um, so whether or not this is Nathan Hale, it maybe doesn't matter because it caused George W. Seymour to purchase the house. Um, a very interesting end to the story is that George W. Seymour, here's another photograph of him, he never married or had children, but he dearly loved his horse. And um, so he often came um, by car or train, but he often rode his horse. So when the horse died, he actually had the horse buried out behind the homestead. 
He was a noble breed and made the earth rest lightly upon him. That is a statement here that's on this monument that was built for George Dudley Seymour's favorite horse. Um, the name of the horse was Tommy Hooker Bones. Um, the horse was born in 1907 and died in 1937, so it was making it 30 years old. Um, the horse is said to be buried underneath this uh, rock monument, and when they buried it, they um, actually built the monument on top of it. So when you come to the homestead, you will see this. Many people say, who's buried here? George Dudley Seymour's horse. After George Dudley Seymour uh, was done restoring the place, uh, painfully restoring it, uh, he died in 1845 and then the property was given to the Antiquarian and Connecticut Landmark Society uh, who has operated ever since. I don't know how many people died here, but I can tell you that in the 18th century everybody dies at home. There aren't any hospitals, there aren't any old folks homes, so people died at home. And what they usually did was they had a wake and what that means is they would lay out the body in the parlor for a few days to see if they would wake up. Um, in the 18th century, they did not understand being in a coma or being unconscious, but they knew that sometimes dead people woke up. Except for Nathan Hale, all of the family is down in the cemetery. The Nathan Hale Cemetery is about a mile from here. Now, the stories that are already well circulated about the um, unusual activity here is that George W. Seymour brought guests here and they had great parties here and one time they had ridden in in a carriage and his friend got off the horse and buggy and walked up to the, win the windows to look inside and as he was peering in he saw something peering back at him through the window and as he backed off this thing disappeared and uh, it was later said to believe that it was the former owner of the house, Deacon Hale. Um, another story is that perhaps one of the servant girls... Lydia Carpenter, which has been supposedly seen sweeping the upper hallway, or she goes into the kitchen. So she has been felt and heard a number of times through the ages. The uh, guides that work here and give the tours have had a number of experiences. Um, one of them is that upon locking up the door, somebody heard somebody weeping, loudly weeping in the house. Another one is, um, we, we have two guides on usually, and one was giving a tour in the house and heard somebody upstairs and thought the other guide was on a tour and said, um, is anybody, are you up there? Yes, we're up here. And after she finished her tour, she went out to the visitor center in the barn and said, Oh, I thought you were upstairs on the tour. She said, No, I've, I've been in here the whole time. So somebody answered back from the upstairs. So we, we don't know whose voice that was. One of the stories, experiences that happened here was to our guide, Elizabeth. She and her husband had come to a hearth cooking class. And when they were leaving and walking away from the homestead on a very dark night, they looked up at the attic window and they saw a bright light in the window and um, even her skeptical husband <laughs> admitted that he saw this bright light. Now the lights were not on in the attic and even if they were, the single light bulb is behind the chimney stack. So there's something unusual about the window here in the attic behind me. There have been the usual sounds and creaks and lights and some of those the issues are, that's an old house. <laughs> yeah, things move and creak and, and settle. Another story that has been circulated is the sound of chains in the basement. And um, some people seem to think that that's Joseph, uh, Rebecca's father, who, the one who had been on the prison ship and, and came back and died of disease. So here we are, some 60 years later, the museum is open to the public so that people can learn about the Hales, the very patriotic family, and our Connecticut State hero, Nathan Hale. CPR investigated the Nathan Hale homestead in Coventry, Connecticut on August 1, 2009 to try and capture claims of paranormal activity that was occurring within the homestead. The claims of activity included um, some apparitions as well as seeing lights from the attic, 
um, hearing banging sounds, um, voices being heard, as well as the rattling of chains coming from the basement. A few of Nathan Hale's family members have died on the property where the homestead is located, as well as a beloved horse of George Dudley Seymour named Bones. There's actually a monument on the property um, where Bones was buried. The night of the investigation was clear with no rain or wind. Um, the equipment used that night were digital cameras as well as the EMF and K2 meters, um, digital voice recorders, uh, flashlights, um, handheld video recorders with night vision, and a surveillance system. When we set up for the investigation, we used eight cameras on the surveillance system which was uh, distributed throughout the house as well as the homestead. Uh, we're here at the Nathan Hale Homestead and we just got done setting up our video and just to show you how we're set up, uh, camera one right here is in the first floor parlor room, camera two is going to be the uh, second floor facing two stairs into one of the bedrooms, camera three is going up the stairs from the first floor, you can see we got the back, the back hallway as well back here and going up the steps, camera four is down in the basement, and camera five is actually up in the attic. Camera six is the office room, where um, camera seven is outside exterior of the building. We're hoping to capture some, some lights up in these windows when it gets a little bit darker um, or, or something along the side here. And the last camera, actually, we ran it all the way out to the barn that's outside the, uh, the uh, house itself. And um, that's going to be a good shot. That's pretty much it. The cameras are set up. We're ready to rock and roll. Our team had a few personal experiences during the investigation. One of them was when Anne Marie was out in the barn. Uh, there was a light source that was coming in from the outside and she was actually able to see a shadow um, move across the light source, completely blocking it out. Being on the bench, looking directly up into the loft where the fan is, there's a split in the boards that lets a straight line of light down. And when we first sat down, I saw something move in front of the light. And then we sat there for a while with the K2 meter and the digital recorder, and it did it again twice. It blacked it out, and I said, here, there it is again, and then it went back the other way. It was kind of weird. A second one was when Chuck was upstairs. He was, when nobody was around him, he felt his shirt being tugged. I was up in the attic, in, uh, up in the mannequin room, or whatever room they want to call that, and um, I was with Dan and Jay, and I went to turn. I had my back turned facing uh, Dan and so, something tugged my shirt. I mean, it, like, like, a, like a little couple tugs. I thought it was Jay walking behind me to get, to get by me because it was real narrow up there. He was 25 feet the other way and Dan didn't see anybody behind me. Looked around with the K2 and didn't really get any hits, but it, it was a tug on my shirt. A third one was when Anne Marie and I were investigating upstairs. We heard a loud banging sound. No, there's got to be someone in here. Someone that's not going to be afraid. Who's brave. Say, you know what, yeah, I am here. Um, afterwards, we went to see where the banging sound came from. Nobody else, none of the other investigators heard it, and there was nothing that was found out of place. The fourth one was in the same room where Chuck's shirt was pulled on, um, we tried the knocking game, which is where you would um, knock out a tune from um, one of the older tunes that might be known to the people back in the 17 or 1800s, and you listen to hear if they can finish the rhythm of the tune, and we did um, get a successful knocking back. Make a noise, knock, finish this. Oh my freaking god, who just did that? What? Because I knocked and it went boom, boom right I after. Did, I didn't hear that. Okay. Finish this. Oh my freaking god, who just did that? What? Our team also captured some evidence with uh, the surveillance system and the K2 meters as well as the voice recorders. Our first piece of evidence caught involves the K2 meter. The K2 meter is a type of EMF meter that detects excess energy that leaks out of any electrical source or appliance. It's also used to pick up spirit energy. When a spirit approaches, the light indicators will light up letting us know when a possible spirit is present. 
Chuck and Dan were out near the uh, monument for George Seymour's horse bones and they got some reaction with the K2 meter. All right, so we're out here at the Nathan Hale Homestead and we were doing um, some EVP work around that tower right there that's built as a monument to uh, a horse that was buried on the property. We were taking around a K2 meter. At first, I just turkled, took one around, circled the whole monument and got a K2 hit, fully pegged to the red. Dan took some grass and tell him what you did, Dan. I just tried to talk to a horse how you would. Tried to feed it grass and uh, after a couple of minutes of doing that, our K2 meter pegged. We had, we had asked it if it wanted to go for a ride, and when I asked if it wanted to go for a ride, uh, it, it seemed like it just came up to where we were at, and the K2 took another hit. Looks like he was standing there with his head out when I came around and just hit it. All right, Bones, maybe you're over here. Come here, Bones. Where are you? Come here, boy. Come here, boy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. I just got a full. Can you make those lights light up again? Are you over here? Here you go. Here you go, horsey. I'll make sure it wasn't on camera. That thing went all the way to red. You want to go for a ride? You want to go for a ride? You do? You want to go for a ride? All right. We can go for a ride if you want. Come here. Go for. Come here. Let's go for a ride. Come on back over. Come on back over. We'll go for a ride. Hey, buddy. How you doing? How you doing, buddy? Well, that was an unexplained K2 hit by the horse's monument. Two separate hits we had. Maybe it was the horse. Wanting to go for a ride. Did a, did a sweep at the end to make sure there was nothing that could have possibly set the K2 off. Equipment. No um, underground wires. And looks it was good to me. I mean, only around the monument. And that's the only part of property where there's actually anything buried. So it's something very interesting. Something we'll have to send another group out and look at. Our second piece of evidence caught was a strange light viewed on one of the surveillance cameras that was located outside. Um, the light actually starts from the, um, when you're viewing it on the left side of the screen, um, it goes down and then the, along the edge of the camera and then it goes back up. Uh, we don't have an explanation for what the light source was, so we, we're not certain what it is. Our third piece of evidence caught was um, caught by both Anne Marie and myself while we were in an upstairs bedroom. It was caught with a digital voice recorder and it was an EVP, um, also known as an electronic voice phenomena. The voice wasn't heard while we were present when we were there. It was caught by Anne Marie when she was playing back the um, digital recording. It was just the angle that I was holding with the camera. Not It was just the angle that I was holding with the camera where it reflected. Lastly, um, the fourth piece of evidence that we caught was when Ray was investigating in the kitchen using the K2 meter and he got what appeared to be intelligent responses for, um, from the K2 meter. There's somebody here with us. If you're here, come close to me and these lights will light up. Whoever just passed in front of me, can you do it again? There we go. All the way up to red. Okay, if you stand back, that's good. If you'd like to communicate with us, come as close as my hand 
and I'm holding this object that, as close as you can and more lights will light up. If that was you, do it again. Thank you. I got. I just had a spike on the other EMF meter a minute ago. Not now, though. Well, that's not that it's doing it. I'm going to ask you yes or no questions. If it's a yes question, come close to this thing again and the lights will light up. If it's no, just stand back. Do you live here? Thank you. That was good. Are you one of the Hale Sons? Is your name Lydia? Were you a servant here? You hold this, Jay. Mm -hmm. There it is. Are you one of the Hale daughters? How do I zoom this thing? Oh, yeah. Thank you. If you step back, the lights will stop flashing. Thank you. I'm not getting anything out of it, you know. Did you die in this house? Is that yours or is that your dad's? This is mine. Is that yours? Got a brand new battery in it. If you died in this house, come close as possible to this machine so those lights will light up. Thank you. That was strong. That was a strong bit. Do you like being here? Thank you. It's kind of a pulse. I'll turn off my phone just to make sure. Are you the only one in this house? If you are, light up the lights. If there's more than one of you, when I get to the number, light up the lights. Are there two of you here? Three. Four. Five of you. There's five of you. Thank you. Count the seconds in between that it's flashing just to make sure it's not something like a pulsation through any electrical lines. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm going to speak to the one of the Hale daughters. If you're here again, can you light up these lights again for me like you just did? This way I know I'm speaking to... Thank you. I'm not getting any spikes on this EMF meter. Any other one on the other one either. Were, the, were you the youngest daughter? Were you the oldest daughter? Is your name Sarah? Is your name Elizabeth? They didn't like me. <laughs> if you are a female... Oh, Very you nice. are a female. Okay, thank you. That 
All right, if you can back away from it and stop the lights so I can ask you another question. My camera on. Do you understand what I'm saying? If yes, come close again to the... Thank you. Intelligent. Yeah, it's not... Are you upset because we're here? If you are, wave your hand in front of it again. If not, don't light up the lights. There's five of you here. Five spirits. If that's right, come close to the machine again. Light up the lights. Four. Six. Oh, there's six of you. I'm sorry. That's Thank just you. Just about 30 seconds. How many women are here? Is there just one woman here? Two? Three? Four? Are you all women? Twenty-two seconds. Thirty-two seconds. 22 seconds. I'm going to set this on the table and if you want you can light it up right off the table. Not, and there's like no other like sources around here? Like not on the ground? Did you sweep it all or anything? Alright, stay where you are. I'm just going to sweep around and see if this lights up by itself. Although while investigating at the Nathan Hale homestead we did not get on video a full body apparition, we did experience banging noises, voices on the digital voice recorders, shadows, uh, physical contact, as well as intelligent interaction with K2 meters. With a place so rich in history, one wouldn't need to question why the Nathan Hale homestead would be experiencing paranormal activity. Myself, as well as the rest of the CPAIR team, wants to thank Bev for her time in allowing us to come in and investigate the Nathan Hale Homestead. We hope you enjoyed the documentary video that we have produced during our investigation here, and we hope that you visit us at www.cpairgroup.com. And if you have any comments or recommendations, please email them to cpair at cpairgroup.com. Thank you.